My name is Brad Saflo. I'm here today uh, to talk a little bit about short selling and why an absolute return focus is critical. I am the CEO of PA Research, which is an independent investment research firm. Uh, we differentiate ourselves based on the rigors of our fundamental analysis and the extent of our primary research. So at PA Research, we made the decision to keep our research behind a paywall. Practically speaking, and this is the single most important reason for this choice, is that the efficacy to my clients of a short idea that is widely distributed is virtually zero. You, know, you see activist short sellers who have already taken positions, and then they put out a piece of research. In some cases, they're fantastically researched and documented and uh, have really well thought out investment theses. In some cases, they're pure hyperbole. Either way, what you almost always see is that the borrow cost, the availability of the short, goes up immediately upon the publication of that piece. And in often cases we're seeing now that people are front running those trades too, which is a whole dynamic that I want no part of. So for my clients, when they get a piece of research from us, they know that it is extremely well researched, backed by, again, rigorous fundamental analysis, a lot of primary research surveys, channel checks, things of that like, and that more, most importantly, they can actually execute a trade thereafter if they feel like the thesis is worthwhile. Um, and that is a critical dynamic for, for me personally, that I cannot dilute the efficacy, uh, the ability of my clients to actually act on any of the research that we're providing. Aside from not distributing our research widely, we also uh, focus on ideas generally that have an average daily trading volume, let's say at least 15 million market our sweet spot in terms of market gap tends to be one to 10 billion. I've written up ideas that have, are higher than that. But most important, more than anything, is that I want to have a research product that is a huge value add to my clients. For me personally, I do take positions in the companies that we are short. I, my firm, we have a blackout period around trading when we publish reports. Um, I do not want to ever be in a position where my trading activity is questioned based on things we knew about uh, publishing a report. So we try and take the highest ethical standards. And more than anything, when we, our entire philosophical approach to research, again, is to be focused on a secular short idea, a company that is challenged either from its business model, competitive dynamics, uh, structural changes in their industry, um, any sort of issues in their end markets, uh, the list can go on and on, but it's fundamentally oriented. Do I want my short ideas to work in a very short time frame? Of course. Uh, practically speaking, do they? No. So from our perspective, and everyone has their own way in which they identify shorts, some people have a vocabulary of names that they know extraordinarily well. Others are doing forensic accounting screens. Some are relying entirely on their network. For me, it's a combination really of names I know well, ideas that are born out of work that we're doing in other areas. Um, I am focused on secularly challenged businesses almost exclusively is uh, a short idea. I have found that any short that is heavily reliant or any short thesis that is heavily reliant on a fraud element, accounting fraud element, evaluation dynamic, litigation or regulatory issues as a primary thesis are incredibly dangerous. And not to say that those shorts haven't worked out. Uh, we've seen plenty of examples where in this year where we've seen huge blowups in the marketplace for companies that are have been exposed as fraud. But what's not being said is that people identified those frauds one, two, three, five, ten years ago. And whether it's you know wire card or any other name you want to pick, short sellers had to endure extraordinary pain. Now I will say that on every single good short I've ever had, and they tend to be multi-year uh, in duration, that investors have to endure rallies of 30 to 50%, anywhere from three to five times on the journey to what you hope is a zero or an ex a much lower stock price. So I think it is absolutely critical for any short seller to identify right from the jump, what are the catalysts and what is the time frame over which you will get paid? Because if you don't, and you have a an accounting fraud or the biggest fraud that ever existed or evaluation that is just beyond absurd, or the combination of all of those, if you don't have a hard catalyst fundamentally, from my perspective, you will absolutely get carried out. Since the firm was founded, let's say about 10 years ago, we've had 
a few names that have gone to zero, uh, probably the most notable of which was ITT Educational Services. And that, that was a process that lasted, uh, let's call it four or five years, which is extraordinarily long. And at every single turn, uh, we felt even a higher level conviction about our thesis. However, the company was taking actions to increase its stock price, either through promotion or misleading investors, um, pursuing fraudulent activity, buying back their stock any number of combination of activities. And so over that time frame, we saw that stock go from above 100 to the low teens, back to 40, to mid teens, bounced again, and then eventually to zero. Now today, I've been doing a lot of work on a company called TruePangin, which is the largest uh, pen insurance company in the United States. They have a completely structurally flawed business. They are not profitable. They will never be profitable. Uh, they are what I would call uh, in the midst of a, an insurance rate spiral, whereby the company's loss experience continues to rise as pets get older. They're having to increase price at, a, uh, at an alarming rate, 10 to 20 percent in some of their largest markets annually on their premiums. And as a result, the company is now pricing itself out of the market where consumers are being forced to pay 100 to 200 dollars a month just to insure their pet. Now, these dynamics are getting worse. The company's operating performance has declined in terms of profitability. And even at a statutory level, there's no evidence that the company has any sort of operating scale. They've been able to grow. And so for now, which is a familiar theme in this market where if growth is sustained, investors are willing to believe in the total addressable market story and the theory that this company at some point could generate meaningful profitability. However, the, you know some of the growth in the more recently has been driven by uh, COVID-19 and a huge surge in pet adoptions. And I think everyone understands anecdotally, uh, but pet adoptions are up, depending on the market, 150 to 700 percent. We're seeing mean reversion in pet adoption activity. And in many cases, sadly, pets are being returned. Uh, what's happened over the last two or three years while this was going on is that the competitive intensity of the marketplace has increased dramatically. Japan now faces competition from hugely uh, uh, huge insurance companies with enormous balance sheets. And as a result, their pet acquisition cost is going through the roof. So from my perspective, as soon as the company's growth in terms of pet enrollment slows, their loss rates will start to increase. And then you get into the insurance rate spiral, spiral in a very acute manner where the company could completely unravel. Um, it is one of the best short ideas I've ever encountered in my career. And I've been completely wrong about the stock really since I wrote it up. And so that's the struggle. You say, okay, well, I have high conviction fundamentally uh, in everything that I've gathered and can look at both from the company, its competitors, its statutory filings, any sort of checks that I do. It all points to the same thing. The company will be very hard pressed to ever make money and it is trading at 11 times tangible book value. Now, will I get paid in the next quarter on this name? I mean, certainly the chart is starting to show some troubles and I think people recognize that there's a... Uh, at the very least, a mean reversion in the fundamental performance of the company in terms of enrollment growth on the pet side. But this is a, an insurance company that has been positioned as some sort of technology platform, even though they spend no money on tech. Um, so I absolutely love this idea, and I think it will work out fantastically well. And I just keep focused on, obviously, you want to manage risk around your position. So I do have a personal short position in Trupanion. I own puts, all of that. Um, and I've sized it appropriately, but I think we're getting close to the point where people are going to recognize this business for its, for what it is and its real troubles. So in terms of if a, if a short starts working against me, I, the very first exercise I need to undertake if it's a 20, 25, 30% move is to understand, okay, what are the reasons, the causality? And that is often, it can be difficult, but if you understand in the context, well, TAM stories or this factor, the pet factor, you know, all these other names traded up, mensurate with Trupan, you could say, okay, this is not necessarily related to people changing their perception of this company. It had a lot, it had a lot more to do with flows. Now, if it's something different and you're like, okay, well, am I wrong about my fundamental thesis? Has there been a re-rate of this business because something has changed fundamentally with the business? Then that requires a re-rate, a resizing, if not a full exit. So it depends on the dynamics. Now, as far as when a stock starts to work, you know, I find it difficult sometimes to press a name, particularly in this environment, until I feel like it's really quite clear that the business uh, is broken and the investors understand that. And 
somewhat uh, counterintuitively, that often involves pressing it when its valuation is at its lowest point. Um, and particularly in this environment where you see um, some of our best short ideas have traded at eight to 10 times earnings for a prolonged period of time, you know, had a longstanding short call on acuity brands, that stock is screened as cheap for a very long period of time, and their fundamentals were deteriorating. Uh, we've done a ton of work in the for-profit education space. You know, one of our favorite names right now is uh, Producio Education. It trades at sub, uh, sub seven times earnings. A company could easily go to zero, um, even though they have a large cash balance. Um, they have a fundamentally flawed business and a, an ultimate product that has, from my perception, no value. A lot of this is understanding stock price action in the context of everything else going on in the market. Even though I tend to focus on individual stocks, I need to understand the waters in which that has driven the stock behavior uh, to, that really di dictates the decision that I make on any given trade. I maintain a long short book and every quarter, uh, my, my gold subscribers for PA research are able to see our entire holdings of the long and short position. So. Uh, since inception, uh, what I call the SAF portfolio, which is obviously short for my name, has compounded uh, at about, well, over the last five, six years, at about 35%. Um, so on the long side, um, you know, a lot of the work that I'm able to do fundamentally, um, for sure, it's, it's the same rigor there. Uh, ultimately, I'm looking for a significant variance uh, to consensus. I think one of the bigger areas of differentiation relative to how some others manage their books, um, I will take on highly concentrated positions. So 20, 30% on top ideas. Some, some people might even say, oh, that's not concentrated enough. But I think uh, if you were to look at the top five holdings, they might represent at any given time 70% plus of the, uh, the long exposure. So I think the combination of conviction, uh, fundamental rigor, and concentration, from my perspective, leads to outsized returns. Yeah, generally speaking, uh, the net exposure uh, that I run is around 20 to 40% net with some rare uh, exceptions where the net exposure has dropped to close to zero. I've not rarely have I been net short, um, but 20 to 40% has been the sweet spot. Generally speaking, gross exposure is around 150 to 200%. Uh, the one thing I've learned over over time is that in terms of managing risk and during periods in which I feel like uh, the market could be on shaky ground or that I have expectations for low uh, low appreciation, uh, taking gross exposure down. As good as I am on the short side, or I like to believe that I am on the short side, I still think cash is one of the most critical hedges. I think the key for any short seller is that the mantra of confidence through work is the single most important element. You will not find a successful short seller in this world who is not constantly trying to enhance and increase their understanding of an individual company, the market, uh, the market elements, competitive dynamics to solidify their short thesis. Conversely, you also have to have a, a large amount of neuroplasticity where you're able to change your mind on something very quickly because uh, conviction without flexibility will get you killed in short selling.